Hello, John. Hey, George. How are you? Good. How have you been? I've been pretty good. I, I've got spring fever today. It's one of these just absolutely fabulous days. Light breeze blowing. There are mm. birds singing outside. Maybe the <laughs> Wagon Heads people can, can even hear them. Oh, ah, uh, wow. Nice here, too. I mean, which we, I think we're maybe finally past our gale force winds that we always get in May. And mm. today so far is nice and still. Yeah, it's a good time of year. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I've actually been pretty busy since the last time we spoke. I um, I had, uh, well, last weekend, actually last Friday night, I, um, I went to a benefit in New York for uh, designers, architects, people who design furniture, people mm -hmm. who design all kinds of uh, devices. And um, one of the, the people whose work was featured there uh, was the science journalist Margaret Wertheim, whom... Oh, you know, yeah, that's right. I just saw her at the Los Angeles Book Fair, yes, the book festival. That's right. She mentioned that. And, and, yeah. And, um, and she had her a piece of her uh, knitted coral reef on display there. Really? Yeah. Reef? Like... Yeah, have you heard about this? No, no. Well, I, she, wow. She actually has some skill beyond being a science... Science writer and skilled lecturer on science and religion. Yeah, um, this this uh, this project is is so cool. Um, I've heard about it from her for years, and I've seen pictures of it on the web. This is the first time I've I've actually seen it. Um, it's something that she has created with her uh, identical twin sister. I don't know her um, name, yeah, but I, I think she's right. an artist or art historian, uh, something like that herself, and the two of them somehow got the idea of um, knitting uh, replicas of various kinds of coral, and they and it gradually got bigger and bigger. I think the whole project is more than a thousand square feet, and uh, <laughs> pieces of it have been, um, have been knitted by women all over the world, including Margaret and her sister. And, really? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, as I said, I've seen pictures of it on the web, but sh they had a case. This is at the Cooper Hewitt um, Museum oh, yeah. in uh, New York City, which is a really cool building. And there's this big glass case. I don't know. It must have been four by ten feet with a chunk of uh, Margaret's knitted reef in it. And it was just wow. beautiful. It was exquisitely done in all these different colors and all these different shapes. And um, the science comes in uh, because Margaret says that um, there are different uh, knitting methods that, um, that replicate different types of coral and that actually have something to do with how the coral constructs itself. And it, replic and it, um, and it draws on uh, knot theory and all these complicated mathematical uh, concepts that Margaret is really good at talking about. So, um, wow. So that was really cool. God, I had no idea. I'll, I'll, um, I'll post. That, that's amazing. I'll post <laughs> so she's like basically simulating coral with, with knitting. Yes, yes. But, 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 on, but on, a, on a deeper level than just the surface. Yeah, so she actually, she gives. It's like a coral algorithm that she's um, you know, plugged into herself and outputting it through knitting needles. Yes, and, and all, you know, there's this kind of feminist dimension to it too because, um, uh, knitting, she uh, is this kind of slighted uh, craft, um, mm -hmm. and uh, Margaret says that it's it's actually it can be this wonderful art form, and um, you know of course it's traditionally practiced by uh, women, and so she has enlisted all these other women to help her, and she has these workshops of all all over the place, but she also gives scientific lectures about it. She's invited to mm -hmm. talk at mathematical institutes in Europe and you know, <laughs> really? these kinds of things to talk about um, knot theory and the uh, knitted great coral reef. So, that's amazing. Well, yeah. she did, uh, it's funny she didn't mention that. I, I ran into her in the, um, for, the, for the book festival. They have you know, with the, you know, the so-called green room where the speakers for the different panels hang out. And it was actually the UCLA faculty club that was taken over for the purpose. And I ran into her and... Um, and we sat down with her. She, she was with her, her editor from um, Walker Books, mm -hmm. and she's doing a new book on, you know, like uh, fringe 
kind of on fringe science or fringe scientists, you know, these people that have, who have, um, you know, like, a, you know, their own personal unified uh, field theory of everything. Mm-hmm. And sounds like a fascinating book, so I had a good time, you know, talking to them about that, and then we went off in our separate ways, and little did I know. Yeah, um, well, as I said, I'll post a link to, uh, yeah, I'd to, like her, to see that. her website, and uh, yeah, I've been hearing about, I can't wait to, until her, her book comes out on, um, she sometimes calls it outsider science. Yeah, outsider science, that's the word she uses, rather than fringe. And uh, yeah. I guess one of these, there's a person who, I, I'm sure you get letters like this uh, all the time, um, I certainly have since the beginning of my career, and uh, from people who, as you said, think that they've figured out the secret of the universe, often they like to say that Einstein was wrong, and that quantum mechanics yeah. is misguided, and and they have a whole new mathematical, physical theory of things. And uh, one of these people wrote to Margaret many years ago, and she struck up a correspondence and then befriended this person. And he sounds like this really interesting guy. And so Margaret uh, wrote this book uh, both to talk about this person and how he's been uh, beating his head against the science establishment, trying to um, publicize his theory, but also about the whole phenomenon of uh, outsider science and versus establishment science. <laughs> right. Which is right. which is really interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to interesting to read and to, you know it sounds like it's more than just a, a compendium a compendium of um, you know just really weird theories and people but maybe make some deeper philosophical points. Yeah, like how how do we decide who is not what's true and what's false but who is even qualified to hold our attention when they're yeah, talking about... Well, because science is really, I mean, it's a community of people, you know, constantly interacting and bouncing ideas off each other, so it's really a collaborative process, which doesn't mean that you can't get some lone wolf who comes up, you know, with a brilliant, correct idea, but um, then again, you know, there's good reason to be skeptical. Yeah, and, and what's what haunts me is is that you get some of these manuscripts sometimes... And who not you know, it it could be some solitary genius who has yeah. figured out a um, a really quick and dirty solution to uh, Fermat's last theorem, or yeah. um, you know a really elegant non probabilistic formulation reformulation of quantum mechanics or or yeah. uh, something like that. But hell, if I can figure out, I mean, if I'm qualified to. Uh, well, no, but they, yeah, they usually send them. Of course, it's now it's email. I used to get these things, as I'm sure you did, in, in these big thick envelopes in which they would attach all of the correspondence that they've had with with scientists, you know, going back for the last five years. And, right. And then if you say anything at all encouraging, just to kind of you know be nice, you know, like, gee, this looks like a really really. Um, interesting theory but you know i just have no way to evaluate it you know and then and then they'll um, basically attach that to the packet <laughs> yeah. they send to the next person and maybe even say that yeah john horgan the uh, famous science writers endorsed my theory so i would, <laughs> yeah. was hoping that you will look at it and consider me for the nobel prize i know it's kind of it's kind of pathetic you get the letters that are obviously form kiss off letters <laughs> right, right. It's a little, yeah, like getting chain, old-fashioned chain letters. Yeah, and these guys think that it's, uh, you know, in my correspondence with Francis Crick or, you know. <laughs> right, which consisted of Francis Crick's standard postcard where he checked the box, right. you know, all the things I do not do, and one of them is uh, review your amazing new new theory of of the universe. But, um, but yeah, yeah, well, it's, well, it's, that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. So anyway, so coming um, out of the blue, yeah, you know, I've been, uh, I, I was catching up um, yesterday on all the stuff you've been doing for Scientific American. Yeah, I've been, I've been having fun um, blogging for them lately. I write a piece uh, once a week, and um, I can write. Yeah, about... I hadn't really appreciated that was a week. That's a weekly thing. That's really a nice forum. Yeah, it is great. I mean, they've got a really uh, high quality uh, readership. I would say probably right up there with the blogging heads audience. In terms of intelligence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll say they'll say very highly intelligent, intelligent comments. Yeah. Well, I was uh, I was particularly struck struck by the one about the uh, simulation of the cat brain. 
ah. the artificial cat brain. I was wondering, yeah, could you describe that? And there's this sure. interesting controversy over someone else who has, you know, in this blue brain project where they're they're trying to reverse engineer the brain. And um, yeah, so um, why don't you describe that? Yeah, where's the uh, where's my cat brain uh, my cat brain article? Um, yeah, figures I. Seem to have that. Well, okay, I'll just have to do it from memory, I suppose. You're going to have to wing it, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, the reason I did this is because um, uh, there was another piece on the Scientific American website written by a very respected uh, neuroscientist named Terry Sanowski. Oh, who, yeah, I know Terry. He's, yeah. he's really good. He's sort of neuroscience slash computational uh, science. Yeah, so he yeah, does. computational neuroscience, like he and, and Patricia Churchland and yeah, Boya kind of have that, that corner nailed. I remember, nailed I think down. the first time I heard of him was way back in maybe the late 80s. I think he was at Johns Hopkins then. And, yeah, that's um, right. He had, uh, he had done, he had created a program that he said that could learn how to talk. It was like a little artificial baby. And it would start, oh. and it just had some kind of crude learning program and you could you could give it um, uh, sounds and it would gradually learn words and and I guess be able to put together rudimentary sentences that's how I remember it so and, this was a it was an artificial neural network right yes. where, where you basically simulate a bunch of really simplified neurons interacting and then and then you use some kind of statistical learning algorithm yes yeah. and um, and so I'm, I think I interviewed him for that and I've interviewed him on and off over the years for neuroscience stories, and particularly for stories on, um, well, the neural code, for example, uh, sort of the intersection between neuroscience and, uh, and uh, computation. And he had a piece in Scientific American recently uh, um, on its uh, website about this controversy that has sprung up over um, uh, scientists who were simulating brains. In one case, mm -hmm. it's an IBM scientist named, um, I wish I could uh, find this piece so I could get the names right. Oh, wait, right here, let me, uh, it's a I, guy have, named, I have uh, it here. Oh, wait a minute, here it is. It's a oh, guy Hen named, there's Henry, Mar Henry Markram. Yeah, so the cat brain is actually simulated by a guy named Darmendra Moda, who's, right. who's an IBM researcher, and I heard him give a talk at the Singularity Summit, the, this thing that's hosted by oh, yeah. Ray Kurzweil two years ago, right? And I, and he talked about this cat brain that he was uh, that he was building, uh, you know, a virtual cat brain that is um, is that really is a giant computer program that runs on a uh, an IBM supercomputer, mm -hmm. and apparently he has. Um, He's created this brain uh, with uh, roughly the same number of neurons um, as a cat brain, which I think is about 10 billion uh, neurons. And he says that it roughly uh, uh, simulates the properties of these uh, neurons. And so he is saying, yeah. and this is pretty much what he was saying actually two years ago at the Singularity Summit, that he has built a cat brain. And, yeah. Uh, and there's another guy uh, named Markram, Henry Markram, who's a, a French uh, scientist, or at least he's based in France now, who's also been building a, uh, a brain simulation that is much more detailed than, um, than Moda's, uh, yeah. right down to the, uh, the synaptic details of how the neurons signal to each other. It's got yeah, so he gets down into the, even the ionic channels, right? That's right. I and mean, that's such an interesting question is that what what level of abstraction or what level of detail do you simulate a neuron well see this is the whole problem and what the, the reason i reacted to sanowski's piece is that sanowski talked about how markram was was viciously criticizing uh moda for um for overhyping his cat model and Markram basically accused him of, uh, he used the phrase mass deception. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. He wrote a letter and then made it uh, public to the um, chief technology officer of uh, IBM and, um, and said that uh, Moda's simulation was in no way really a simulation because it was so 
crude and so unrealistic that yeah, um, the, 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 the neurons were too cartoonish in other words right, right. so like he referred to them as point neurons right whereas and i'm not sure what that means but you know apparently you know it means they're just little simple input output devices without all of the dendritic branching right I mean, you know basically a, a neuron you can think of it as like a little black box and then signals you know come in through the dendrites right which is the input That's and then true. some kind of little computation takes place in the neuron and then a different signal you know comes out uh, comes out the um, axon right and then the dendrites of the next neuron pick it up and then you put these all together and you have this complex circuitry but yeah but Mark yeah but so Markram saying that he just really was just really overselling it because the neurons were just just so vastly simpler than than that's, anything that's really in a cat is that yeah that's it and so Sanowski and his piece in Scientific American is reporting on this of course it's called a cat fight um, this uh, <laughs> debate between these two guys and Markram is trying to take down Moda and um, but and but then Sanowski's spin on it is that, okay, these two guys are fighting, but meanwhile, it looks like we are going to have an artificial brain pretty soon. So Sanowski yeah. puts it this yeah. way. Pretty. Did some, he say what he means by pretty soon? <laughs> he says, some are predicting that the first wave of results will arrive within the decade propelled by rapid advances in both brain science and computer science. Um, yeah. This sounds astonishing, but it's become increasingly plausible. So plausible well, the fact that the great race to reverse engineer the brain is triggering a dispute over historic firsts. And yeah. I, I think, and then Sanowski goes on to talk about some details of, of both of these simulations that I yeah. think show that neither of them deserves to be called uh, or, or really uh, uh, mimics anything important that you want to know about how a brain works. So but doesn't Terry basically make that point? I think you. Yeah, you know, but, but then. Say, you know, that uh, you know these these brains don't have any input output, for right. example, and it's more like you're you're simulating a a, a sleeping dormant brain. A sleeping brain or an epileptic. Or one brain. that's having epilepsy, an epileptic so you get seizure. Kind of, you know, you can you know you're just interacting with with itself internally instead of with with any kind of a world. That's right. So they don't, yeah. they're, they're not mimicking anything that you could call um, genuine information processing in the brain. Yeah. Or but are they really, I mean, and I, so, I don't know, I, I don't know much about this, but, you know, after you, after I read your article, I followed some of the links and I was reading, reading about the Blue Brain Project, from, right. you know, this guy, Markram, who, he, who basically said that the cat, you know, what the, the so-called cat brain was actually... He said, light years away from a cat brain, not even close to an ant's brain in complexity. Right. But, uh, but I didn't think, I got the impression that the Blue Brain Project that Markram's doing, the idea isn't to make an artificial brain in the sense that it's going to be this artificial device that's going to think and interact with the world, you know, and be like, um, be like um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, artificial intelligence, like the one in the, the Richard Powers novel, Galatea. 2.0 that's actually like writing poetry and learning about the world and coming up with theories but that it's just simply you know a device to uh, study the you know biomedical you know for biomedical discovery well you know, learning more about the brain by by simulating it as a biological organ but it's really closer maybe to simulating something less complex like a liver or a kidney to get you know a sense of how the secretions work on a far more complex level since it's a brain, but the idea isn't really to make this little box that's going to think. Well, uh, Sanowski quotes Mark from saying this, and this is, this is what I fault him for. Uh, he says that, uh, Sanowski quotes Mark from saying, it is not impossible to build a human brain and we can do it in 10 years. His actual yeah. prediction, he made this in uh, 2009, so he's predicting that by... Yeah. Uh, 2019, we will have an artificial human brain. I mean, to me, that's yeah. a pretty... But it's not clear to me that he means that it's actually going to be, be thinking. Um, well, but if a brain, if you have a brain that doesn't think, then in what <laughs> sense... So that, this is the question that I raise in my piece. In what sense is it a brain if it doesn't think? If it's not, um, if it's not 
replicating any of the functions of uh, of brains. Yeah, and it's yeah, not you can simulate something still, and it, it helps you understand like maybe detailed workings as far as signaling processes, and maybe even a neural code. Well, you then, know, it's then just it's, one more, you know, a very to, important set of set of data points to learn how the brain works. But you know, it, it seems to me that you can do that without without actually creating artificial intelligence, which you know, it seems like. Um, like Markram, you know, was kind of, has a qualification in some places on his website. Well, I guess what what so my interest in this comes from you know I've written about the neural code and mm-hmm. uh, the attempt to understand exactly how the brain processes information, and it seems like one of those problems um, that becomes deeper and more complicated the further that we go into it. So the basic yeah. problem with trying to simulate the brain and trying to understand uh, what the brain does that's really important is that we, as you said before, we don't really know what's the proper level that we should be looking at or yeah. whether it's every possible yeah. level. So there's certain obvious things that are going on in the brain that we're focusing on and that these simulations focus on. You've got the neuron as supposedly the basic unit of computation and um, the, the action potentials, these uh, electrochemical signals that go between um, neurons as uh, the equivalent of electrical pulses in a uh, uh, computer. But, mm-hmm. um, but there's some neuroscientists who are starting to think that there might be things going on at larger scales and at smaller scales. Even within neurons, there might be all mm-hmm. this computation going on. Markham yeah. seems to recognize that in uh, him, his simulations, but still we don't even know enough about how the brain works to know. I mean, the whole idea of a simulation, you have to know what to leave in and what to leave out. And we don't yeah. know enough about the brain to know what to leave in and what to leave out at this point. Yeah, so well, so you try to simulate it at different levels, and then you know this gives you some you know questions that you may be able to ask in other experiments, you know, maybe with real brains. Right. So you kind of have this this dialogue, and you know, as far as like just producing artificial intelligence, I'm still mostly impressed with the you know original arguments of some of the earlier not not, not the early early AI pioneers, but some of the the um, mid pioneers like uh, Douglas Hofstadter, and the idea that intelligence is you know, it's not dependent on on the hardware or the wetware, you know, and the brain's going to have evolved to do this processing. You know, in its own, in its own unique way, but that doesn't mean that you can't skim off the rules at a higher level of abstraction mm-hmm. and simulate them on, on something that doesn't resemble a brain at all in its architecture. Well, again, yeah, that's still a controversial, controversial view. And, and there's again, there's ranges. There are people like you know, we've talked about Herbert Simon and Alan Newell, and you know, there it was just very, very abstract, um, high level. You know, rules-based, you know, rules of thinking kind of simulation that, mm-hmm. you know, has, certainly hasn't led to anything that you'd really, I think, think of as artificial intelligence. And then there's people like Hofstadter who are looking at a more detailed kind of emergent thing where you have, you know, little little agents and you know that interact with each other. And yeah, it's, I, you know, it's interesting. It's still. It's still so unclear after 20 years of following this stuff. Well, so the you know the basic assumption of the artificial intelligence people was that essentially the stuff of the, you know the the material substrate of any kind of thinking device doesn't matter that much. Yeah, it's irrelevant. And, then and, you, can, and you know and the whole the, the you know the Turing principle is that any any kind of computation or really any any uh, physical deterministic process. But there's, you know, can be can be simulated on a deterministic Turing machine, and if the brain is a deterministic Turing machine, you should be able to simulate it, you know, at whatever level of detail you want, and get something that you know does the does the equivalent, you know, the, computation, and then complex enough that you'd call it thinking. But you know, then you have people that really think the details matter on the biological level, but mm-hmm. the details. But, and, I, and but the I got stuff. the feeling with Markram that really wasn't his motivation. It was just really. I mean, you could be completely agnostic on that argument and still just want to use uh, simulations of brains to, you know, help understand, you know, what the neural code is, if you can really speak of something called a neural code and how the brain is information 
processing, but you know, without actually emulating it. Yeah, I know, but then he shouldn't say something like that. We're going to build a, an artificial brain within ten years. Because, yeah, because well, that does he, he, that does raise. You know, I agree that to most the, people who would read this, in fact, probably just about everyone, they would think it's going to be a thinking. A little box that thinks. Right. Instead of something. And, that, and, and, but but I think it's probably true that he doesn't think of it that way when he said it. But. Um, well, Sanowski interpreted. But it's it good. That that, way. Well, yeah. But but so he's so, so, so Sanowski was really saying that he thought this was going to be a brain that would think. Well, yeah, and Sanowski. I've talked to him before about the singularity. Um, yeah. And yeah. Oh, right. You know, Terry is really. Uh, he thinks that he's still a true believer in AI and, um, you know, all these converging lines of technology and science making really amazing things happen in the future. And actually... Oh, but it, doesn't everyone believe that? I don't believe it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> huh. I'm... I'm uh, well, it depends on what exactly we're talking about. And yeah, I know. Let me see. I, let me put it this way. It's not that I don't think... It, it, these things can happen. It's that I don't see, and this is kind of the point of my the piece that I wrote for Scientific American, I don't see any reason to believe now in some of these predictions about artificial brains, artificial intelligence, uh, the creation of superhumans with IQs of 10,000 downloading our, our yeah, digitized well, I'm psyches with you there. into, yeah. into <laughs> cyberspace, all these kinds of things. No, I'm not a singularity person. Okay, singularity no. or some of these, you know, the artificial brain. So Terry actually thinks that the singularity, meaning um, some kind of super intelligence, which might either be purely artificial or some kind yeah. of biological uh, silicon hybrid, he thinks that's going to happen. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And I'm agnostic and skeptical because I just don't see anything happening right now that makes me... Uh, that makes me uh, persuaded that it's going to happen. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, so. we've, it really has been a huge amount of progress. I mean, just the fact that they could simulate simulate a brain or, 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 or you know, a cortical column of a brain at the level of detail that they're doing with the Blue Brain Project is just astonishing to think of, even compared with, you know, what was available a few years ago as far as computing power. Yeah, I mean, at some point, it's just that you can go back any time, and there are these incredibly rapid advances in our mm -hmm. understanding of how the brain works. Works. Uh, you had Moore's law going back to at least the early '60s, so yeah. tremendous advances in computation. And people have been talking about how there is going to be this astonishing new thing coming out of the convergence. Yeah, well, of people are always things. overly optimistic and <laughs> you know, in, in predicting, but I mean, it's really probably not very smart to make any kind of prediction where you actually say X number of years. Well, since we're talking about prediction, I guess I wanted to tell you also about a conference that I went to. This is actually, um, uh, it was the day after I saw Margaret Wertheim in uh, in New York. So that was a um, that was last Friday night, and mm -hmm. uh, and then that night, uh, no, actually last Thursday night, a week ago mm -hmm. uh, from yesterday, and um, and then that night I uh, drove to Newark, right to, next to Newark Airport, and stayed in uh, I think the most disgusting motel that I've stayed in in my entire life, uh, in O'Connell Lodge. Um, with uh, somebody very loudly having sex in the room next to me all night. Oh. It was just a nightmare. Um, oh, and then a 6 a.m. flight probably. I had a 6.15 flight, so I had to get up at 4 in the morning anyway. I had just fallen asleep oh. um, when I had to wake up again. Uh, but anyway, then I went to this conference at Ohio State University on uh, something called hybrid warfare, mm -hmm. and, which is a uh, big buzzword in... Um, military circles right now to describe uh, war that involves both um, uh, conventional and uh, irregular forces. Uh, it can be guerrilla warfare. It just kind of means complex warfare. Uh, any kind of war other than two big state-supported uniformed armies facing off and trying to beat the crap out of each other. Okay, yeah. Um, so obviously we're in hybrid wars in Iran and or Iraq and Afghanistan right now. Yeah. And the point of this conference was to look at um, uh, hybrid wars in history 
that might provide lessons for um, that would help us in Iran or excuse me Iraq and Afghanistan mm -hmm. and uh, and in other similar wars um, in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was interesting about it was that it wasn't the usual sort of liberal dovish uh, social scientists. It was um, it was a very I, I think it's fair to say hawkish group of speakers. They're all military historians. Mm -hmm. uh, except there's one four-star general who is actually, uh, I think, commander-in-chief of the uh, uh, Marines, who is a speaker, who is not an historian. Yeah, yeah, you wrote about, this is, we should say, this is another one of your, your pieces for Scientific American, describing this conference. Yeah, so, um, and what was, I, yeah, I wrote a piece for Scientific American called, uh, titled, Are Predictions of Endless War Self-Fulfilling? Um, mm. Because what was interesting and somewhat disturbing about the conference was that, first of all, there was this kind of amoral quality to the presentations. And by the way, that mm -hmm. you know, some of the cases they looked at were even the American Civil War, which had a lot of guerrilla uh, warfare, apparently the, um, the American Revolutionary War, um, the War of uh, Napoleon in uh, the Spanish, uh, the Iberian Peninsula mm -hmm. in the early 19th century. Um, in which he faced both conventional Spanish forces and a lot of uh, guerrilla uh, forces, <laughs> Rome against Germany, uh, Vietnam. So there are all these yeah. different examples of, of uh, wars where you had a major power that really got bogged down in this complicated fight that had sort of political and social as well as military ra ramifications. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the speakers seemed to... They, you know, it wasn't about the rightness or wrongness of any of these wars. It was just about what could have been done so that they could achieve military victory and political victory as well. Hmm. Uh, and, 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 and you wrote that the that the underlying assumption that nobody seemed to even think of questioning was that war is inevitable, and that we have maybe we even have some kind of warrior gene, or at least it's so ingrained in the system that it's never going to end. That's right. Um, yeah, so completely opposite from from what you've been telling us. Well, well, so actually, there's a guy at Ohio State, uh, a political scientist named John Mueller. He was not one of the speakers, but he attended the conference, and I talked to him, who has been writing for, God, I think probably 15 years now, that um, we are, that the era of international war might uh, be over. Hmm. And um, so he's pointed out that there have been uh, no wars between major powers since the um, since the end of World War II. We've had proxy yeah. wars uh, between the U.S. and Soviet Union, for example, but no direct confrontations. Uh, yeah. Civil wars are down since the early 1990s. Even inter international wars of any kind have become much less frequent. He says that really the last large-scale international war with lots of casualties was between Iraq and um, Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that wasn't so long ago. Yeah. Um, but that. But less <laughs> frequent is his point. Um, right. Well, and does he attribute that to, to, to the deterrent effect of nuclear weapons or to uh, or to or Robert Wright-like you know, realization of zero-sumness that, you know, cooperation... You can cooperate without one side losing to the other, and it's to both sides' benefits. Or what's interesting about Mueller's analysis is that he thinks it's happening. So it, most people. So there are other uh, scholars who commented on the decline of, um, or that you know, who have just pointed out that we're in a period with uh, very little international war, and they mm -hmm. usually attribute it to a, a really common explanation is uh, democratic peace. So mm -hmm. democracy has spread a lot since. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is that your alarm clock? That's my. Uh, that's my phone. I'll just. I'll, oh. I'll just unplug it. Um, I'm so, glad to uh, hear it rings and doesn't like play Inagata Devita or something. <laughs> uh, maybe for the next blogging heads, I'll, I'll get that to happen. Um, so some scientists or some scholars have said that. That the democratic peace explains uh, the decline of war. Some have said that it's an mm -hmm. overall spread of uh, human rights, rights for 
uh, women and so forth. Uh, some think that the UN actually is sort of doing its job and helping to mediate disputes between um, uh, nations. Mueller thinks that it's this kind of separate variable that we are just getting tired of war and yeah. that, the, uh, that um, leaders and citizens recognize the irrationality of war today more than ever before, certainly more than we did mm. at the beginning of the 20th century before World War I broke out. He pointed out that at the beginning of the 20th century, you still had a lot of um, major intellectuals and political leaders who talked about the benefits of war and how war helped to yeah. toughen up societies and so forth. He said, you just don't get right. that kind of rhetoric anymore. Uh, so he thinks it's just happening and it's going to continue happening. Yeah. Regardless of anything else that we do, it's it, yeah. it's almost. But, uh, it, but and basically, within war studies, I guess you'd call it. Is that still is that a minority? I minority would say, to you? Well, or, or not? I would say he is more optimistic than most, but there are uh, some others. And you know, the whole problem with pointing out that we're in this period of relatively low war is that uh, you know you can you can have a in human affairs and politics, you can have a black swan event anytime, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's people who will say, well, yeah, maybe it looks great now, but, you know, yeah, just wait <laughs> wait 10 years and, or 100, and you can't really really extrapolate much from this little, you know, that, that it's just an anomaly, this this current current period. But, God, what a depressing thought. I mean, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, there is such a thing as cultural evolution well, this is, uh, so I actually asked the organizer. Evolution is in the upward sense, which is. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Bob yeah. Wright sense, you know, we're yeah. all recognizing. Bob Wright, zero sumness sense. Yeah. Um, so I did pull the, uh, the speakers at the conference, and uh, there was one guy from the University of Calgary named Ferris who thought that, yeah, war can end if we create a global government, which in a way yeah. is kind of like saying war won't end but the, well yeah <laughs> but the yeah. um the organizer of the meeting it's this guy named peter mansour who just retired from the army two years ago and he was the um the executive officer to uh, general petraeus who's the commander of u.s forces in uh iraq that was uh mansour's last job before he um before he retired mm. and, and he's written two books of history very smart guy and um I brought up, so he was familiar with Mueller's writings about uh, the decline of war, and uh, Mansour said he saw a lot of parallels between our era and uh, the early 20th century um, when uh, you had a period of about a century uh, mm -hmm. between um, major wars. So, the, so Europe was racked with war up until about 1814, the Napoleonic Wars. And then you, you had a few minor regional wars over the next century. And a lot of people started talking about the possibility that um, major international war, especially in Europe, uh, might be over. Mm -hmm. And then World War I broke out. And this guy, yeah. Mans Mansour, yeah. said, I think that's the kind of period we're in now. Yeah. Uh, people are starting to get their hopes up, but their hopes will be dashed. And yeah. that, uh, we have to be prepared not just for regional wars like Iran or Iraq and Afghanistan, but uh, mm. but uh, even a major war between superpowers. Mm. Yeah, God, this is just such a rich, rich subject. I mean, but you really, you really are going to do a book on this, I hope. Yeah, I guess I gotta get it out of my system. Um, yeah, no, I did great. It, yeah, it's because I, I don't know of anything that you know just brings all of this together. <laughs> you know, between two covers, the different conflicting points of view. and Well, there's also that, you know, one thing that interests me, and I brought it up in this little piece that I wrote, is just, is the the effect that predictions have. You know, the... the oh, yeah, self-fulfilling prophecies. Right. Um, and so, I, you know, I brought up this uh, this character in, um, in the Isaac Asimov uh, science fiction series, Foundation called Harry Sullivan. Nice. He was this mathematician that. Did you ever read Foundation? Long, long, long time ago. I think I started reading it, but I didn't get through the whole trilogy. But, yeah. Um, I didn't either, but it's got lots of really cool ideas in it that I've, uh, yeah. you know, I've looked up on uh, Wikipedia. And one is the possibility that 
you can have a, a really rigorous predictive theory of history and, and social yeah. science. And so Asimov imagines this character, Harry Seldon, who invents this field called psychohistory that is right. supposedly predictive. And, but but it's, the catch is that if he reveals his prediction and if people take it seriously, um, they, they can change their behavior and the prediction won't come true. Well, yeah, yeah, like the daily dilemma of the stock market <laughs> right. or any financial markets. Yeah. Well, I was yeah. thinking that even, you know, Karl Marx had, I mean, this is what makes social science so different than, for example, the physical science. Yeah. Karl Marx has this theory of human economic behavior, and, mm. and part of it is a prediction about these inevitable uh, cycles of uh, political and economic cycles that lead to uh, communism, and yeah. he, he was persuasive enough that he got millions of people to uh, try to fulfill his prediction and, hmm. and created these gigantic empires as a result. Hmm. Um, in one case, we have one of these empires still exists, China, and the other one is, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, collapsed, but it just shows that, you know, even though Marxism is sort of discredited these days, Mm -hmm. um, Marx was still, his predictions in a sense came true just because he was so, because he was so persuasive. Yeah, so you'd see that as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I worry that, you know, if you've got people like this guy, uh, Mansour, and there, this other person, uh, Jim Mattis, this, this four-star Marine general who spoke at the conference, also was absolutely ruling out the possibility that war will ever end. Mm -hmm. Um Barack Obama has also spoken very pessimistically about right, the prospects yeah. for any war. So people of this kind of influence it, uh, can make these their own beliefs uh, self-fulfilling. So mm -hmm. that, that's, mm -hmm. what, um, that's what worries me. Yeah. But of course they would say that predictions of peace would lead to complacency. Mm -hmm that uh, then invites attacks. Right, right, right. So, yeah, it's kind of a paradox. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's good stuff, to your, your, your posts. So I highly recommend them to our audience. Well, thank you. Um, all right. Oh, you know, something I wanted to mention that was in the news today, there were, there were two, um, two big reports, studies, um, whatever you want to call them, on cancer that came out. Yeah, I saw one. Yeah, and one, um, um, the first one was, it was, it's called the President's Panel on Cancer. Yeah. And they issued this report that, you know, basically was um, arguing very, very strongly that, uh, that the cancer establishment, the United States government, science in general, everyone have been vastly underplaying the extent to which um, uh, cancer is caused by um, chemical industrial produced carcinogens mm -hmm. and um, and but what's interesting I mean a lot of people believe that you just assume that's true I think that's kind of part of the folk the folk beliefs about cancer you know is that it's caused by all these industrial chemicals and things but actually when you go back and and look at what's known about that it's still very much up in the air it's still a huge question yeah I mean beyond certain things that have really been established without question like the dangers of um, of inhaling uh, tobacco smoke into your lungs, you know, over an extended, extended um, period of time. But it's, but otherwise, it's really a question that's up in the air. And there there are these two kind of conflicting schools of thought. You know, one being cancer is almost um, entirely imposed from the outside by the environment, and especially by things we've produced ourselves. You know, as opposed to natural carcinogens like in what is that broccoli or something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that guy Bruce Ames that's uh, written a lot about natural carcinogens. And then you have the other side of the argument that says, well, you know, there's to a great degree cancer is just endemic in any biological system, and it's really almost rooted into the Darwinian process, and that the reason, you know, in the, it's a disease of age. You know, the more you have people who are living to longer ages, the more likely you have cancer. So I've been reading about this so, because um, I'm actually working on a book on cancer that I'm not really ready to talk about yet, but I um, saw that that uh, mentioned at the end of your slate piece. 
Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, I forgot I did mention that. that uh, but so I, I'm just, just really getting into it now. But, um, Congratulations, but that was, by the, the way. That controversy really struck me. So then I read this president's panel report, and I thought, wow, this is just coming out completely on one side of the argument, very strongly, and really almost as though the other side, you, almost as though there wasn't a counter argument. And then a day later, the um, American Cancer Society yeah. issued this um, you know, press release, you know, basically criticizing the report, saying that, well, you know, obviously we think it's important to you know, be very careful about chemical carcinogens, pesticides, etc. Things, you know, monitoring could be better, regulation could be better, but really that's vastly overstating, overstating the case. So just thought I'd put that out there. Yeah, George, what do you think? Is there, you know, I'm always suspicious when, you, when you're talking about cancer, it, it's, such a, it's such an industry with such yeah. high financial yeah. stakes. When I see a dispute like this, I wonder if there is something political or economic going on underneath it. Is, is that? Well, yeah, that's certainly the argument that the, I, I, to, to put this in a, in a different context, this all happened while I was reading this book by, you know, Deborah Davis, the epidemiologist. Uh -huh. uh, she wrote a book called uh, Secret History of the War on Cancer that came out a few years ago. Uh -huh. So I was actually reading this book, and then this, you know, I saw this story, um, story in the Times about the controversy, well, first about the President's panel report, and then I read the report, and I thought, wow, you know, this is really sounds like Deborah Davis's book, and um, also to the extent that it didn't really seem to put credence in the, um, in the counter-argument, and it sort of implied that anyone um, embracing the counter-argument is just, you know, part of an industrial conspiracy to, you know, make, make money by producing carcinogenic pesticides and things, and then making even more money by um, uh, making the expensive chemotherapy drugs to treat the cancer. And wow. so they don't want to prevent cancer because they're making money on both ends. Wow. So, which is, I'm always suspicious of these kinds of conspiracy theories. And then I read the president's panel report and I thought, it's not, it wasn't that radical, but it's pretty much what it was saying. Wow. So then um, it was interesting to see the, the counter reaction from the American Cancer Society you know, which is exactly the kind of thing that would be dismissed by people like Davis as, you know, well, this is because cancer is such a big industry. So but well, I think it's, you know, it's far more complex and, and deeper than that. Is it possible that the American Cancer Society gets some of its funding from... Oh, well, yeah, that's been a constant, you know, a constant criticism. And um, she has something in her book that I read that I guess one of the first uh, presidents of the Board of Advisors was... Um, uh, what was uh, what's his name? Armand Hammer, you know, Occidental, Occidental Petroleum. Right. So, um, but then there's this other book I've been reading. Let's see, I think I just have it over here on my couch. It really gives the opposite view very nicely. It's called Cancer: The Evolutionary Legacy. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about cancer in Darwinian terms and within the body, where where um, a tumor. You know, it, it's like this. It's it's like this little uh, proto organism. You know that through uh, some random combinations of mutations develops this ability to outcompete the surrounding tissues, and if it acquires enough um, of the correct mutations, you know, can even metastasize to other parts of the body. And um, and when you read it from you know that perspective, like you know Robert Weinberg has this nice book called One Renegade Cell, in which he describes the mechanics of all this, and and that you know still leaves open the question of how many of these mutations are caused from the outside by by um, environmental factors, and, and how many are just going to happen anyway from random imperfections and copying mechanisms. But um, you know when you really start from that perspective, it does seem plausible that. Uh, that it's absurd to talk about curing cancer, and that cancer, in a in a way, isn't really a disease in the same sense that um, you know, that, like so many other things are. Like like um, uh, diseases that are caused by pathogens, for example. Although some, yeah, yeah, although yeah. Some I'm not saying this very well because I'm still just really, really getting into this, and I'm very, very puzzled by the whole thing, and I'm just finding a lot of things that I've always sort of intuitively believed aren't true and mm -hmm. so it was just interesting to me to see this controversy come out and then in the same week <laughs> the uh, the famous interphone study on cell phones 
and brain tumors that you and I discussed the last time we were here. Yeah, I I saw I, I was watching I don't know Fox News or something and and uh, heard one of those teasers uh, new evidence for linking cell phones to cancer. Oh, news it's at, so you know, it's news badly, badly, seven. badly misreported in a lot of places, but not not everywhere. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> what, what's the real story, George? Well, basically, you know, because so the Interphone study followed 10,000 people, and um, 10,000 people, 5,000 of whom had um, had brain tumors, two different types of uh, brain tumors. Um, what one one was called a glioma, which mm-hmm. which figures most importantly in the study results, and then 5,000 controls, and this was in like uh, I can't remember a dozen different countries or something, and it was done by all these independent. Uh, scientific research, medical research centers in all these countries, and then, it was, and then all the data was brought together. And basically they interviewed people. They'd say, well, you know, how many times uh, per day do you use your cell phone on and off over the last 10 years? Mm-hmm. So obviously you immediately get a difficulty, you know, whether you know, people can really recall that in any kind of reliable manner. And, um, and so it was based on reporting you know, Mm self-reporting. And then they took the data, and after doing all of the analyses and meta-analyses and allowing for this and that and negotiating, they finally came up with the report. And you could see, you know, we said last year, last time we talked, that it was delayed for like four years while they negotiated over how to to present the results. Mm -hmm. And you can really see why, because they're very puzzling. So first they found, like, like, regular use... Regular cell phone use, according to this epidemiological study, reduces your chance of getting a brain tumor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, obviously, yeah, I mean, that, that was basically dismissed as that's absurd. I mean, actually. they said, they said we really don't think. Hmm? I said that's reassuring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, it's kind of reassuring because it shows it, it would indicate to me that any effect is so slight that it's swamped by noise, and mm-hmm. no one, I don't think, involved in the studies really believed that cell phones have a protective effect in ward off brain cancer. But I actually wrote something about this on my Santa Fe review, and I was sort of fantasizing about the possibility that the cell phone was like a little radiation uh, therapy device and the, <laughs> through some unknown physics that it was zapping little micro tumors before they could blossom. But what the, the consensus was that this was a statistical fluke or it was a flaw in the study, probably based on bad data, people misreporting, sampling bias, um, but, you know, you didn't see that in the headlines. What you saw was this other prediction. Okay, so, so they found that, which they kind of dismissed as a flaw of the study. But then the important thing is they found that when you correlated time spent talking on the cell phone, you know, according to this questionably reliable data, you, and you correlated that with risk of getting one of these two cancers, that there was... Um, there, there, there was no um, step-by-step correlation. In other words, the longer you used the phone, the more cell phone use you had, there was no correlation with increased cancer risk. Mm-hmm. So that's very, very reassuring. But then when you get to the very upper end of the spectrum, where you have people that reported the, the heaviest cell phone use, and in some cases people were saying that they used their cell phone 12 hours a day. Jesus actually talked to it, which, you know, some of the researchers thought was dubious. But among those people, you suddenly, you know, after seeing no correlation with, um, you know, rising cell phone use, suddenly in this group of, like, super users, the uh, risk for glioma jumps 40%. Okay, but that, I bet that's a pretty small group of people, too. So the chances of a Well, yeah, it turns out that, wait, let me see if I can, I can find, find what I wrote on this. When you get Um, something jumping off, you know... The, the, when the, something pops out of the trend like that, you got to be... Well, yeah, and again, most of the scientists, you know, it, it, the report says that we don't believe that this is real. There's just, it's just too weird. And some of the things they suggested was, well, you're getting, you're, you're taking people who have brain tumors, and then you're asking them to recall their cell phone use over the last 10 years. For one thing, if you have a brain tumor, you know, it's going to affect your memory, it's going to affect your your cognition, yeah. and also, if you have what, you know, if you're so unfortunate to get one of these gliomas, you know, it's, you're going to be, like most people, you're going to be desperately looking for some explanation. Right. 
you know, a cause. You don't want to just hear it just randomly happen. So you're going to say, by God, I bet it was my cell phone. So yeah. you're going to be prone to misreport. Mm. So those were two theories. But yeah. anyway, the, story, the study was very murky in the end. But one thing, I was curious when I read that, how many people actually get glioma and what the 40% rise, if it were real, actually meant. So it turns out that you, I, I calculated I, that, well, I looked it up, that a person's odds of being diagnosed with uh, with um, this kind of brain cancer is uh, 1 in 30,000, huh. which is 0.0033%. Right. So you increase that by 40%, and now your risk is 0.0046%. You're really good at crunching the numbers, George. No, but that doesn't come across. And then there are actually headlines, especially in some of the British papers that got advanced copies of the report, saying that it had concluded that there was a link between... Um, you know, create, you know, cell phone use and cancer. Yeah. Because they seized on what was probably a statistical anomaly. Well. But anyway, I'll, I'll just put a link to my post on this, mostly because I have links to other really good things. Like there was a very excellent article in um, BBC News in which they really put this into perspective. So. Um, I would predict that uh, as the uh, the media. The media's uh, financial problems increase that you will see more irresponsible reporting on on uh, medical stories as well as science and political stories just get more um, hype and extremism. Yeah. And well, that's always been there, though, hasn't it? That's I mean, true. it kind of depends on the the publication. Yeah, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's good. That's good to know. I mean, that's uh, that's blogging heads at its finest. Well, then I just, but I kept coming back to something you said when we last talked, which was this really interesting question of, you know, when do you decide enough is enough right. and that you stop studying something? And there was this guy, um, Anthony Swerdlow, Institute of Cancer Research, who uh, said the same, same sort of thing. He said, uh, whether it's worth doing more research is a question for society. Right. These are expensive studies, and there's many other things in the world that should be investigated. Right. It's society which has to answer the question of how long you continue to investigate something that doesn't have a biological basis, or you should have said no, currently no known biological basis. Um, but then it turns out that there's already a bigger, bigger study underway. Oh, Jesus. Something called COSMOS. The cohort study of mobile phone use and health is going to follow... 250,000 volunteers for the next 30 years. So. Who is paying for that? <laughs> um, I guess haven't looked into the details. I guess but, we are, you know, probably. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a uh, European, British wow. and European yeah. study. But, um, hey, John, by 2040, <laughs> you know, the results will be in. And <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's And I imagine, you know, if there's something called bloggingheads.tv then or something like it and civilization still exists and we haven't been destroyed by war, the report will come out and it'll probably be just as murky and inconclusive and they'll maybe launch another study. But then yeah. again, they probably won't have cell phones then and people will be communicating, um, you know, directly through, brain you know, through the infosphere, brain to brain or... You know, anyway. my, my kids um, have this uh, disturbing habit of whenever I bring up any of, any possible health risks or I, I think I, I might have mentioned that the thing I'm most worried about is that they're going deaf from having listened yeah, to yeah, music the, too loud. Yeah, you, you, you put these loudspeakers into, into your ear canal yeah. and, then, and play, this, you know, play loud hip-hop music. And they say, I mean, and they have friends who or they classical. say are already deaf. I mean, seriously, mm. hard of hearing because they play the, the music so loud. And all oh, these and the kids... The deafness isn't the worst part. You know, it's the it's the constant ringing that they're... Yeah. yeah tinnitus. The, we, we talked about this before. How do you pronounce it? Is it tinnitus? tinnitus yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or tinnitus. No, cod. You know, it's one of these Yeah, things. I remember, though. Yeah, we, we, we never got that down. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, um, I always think of the cartoon character Tintin for well, some reason. Well, I used to think it was Tintinitis, but uh, I know that's wrong. Yeah. But the, so this, anyway, the ringing in your ears, it never goes away, which is just a horrible, horrible thought. Yeah, and these kids think that all this is going to be solved by medicine in the future. Any oh. problems that they have now, that they can abuse their bodies in every possible way, and that it's going to be fixed by the, the miracles of science. In the future, oh, well, I hope I, you gave him a copy of The End of Science to read. <laughs> yeah. Oh, believe me, I've given him a big dose of, uh, of my, uh, my science and techno-skepticism, George. So, uh, <laughs> I bet you have. But, uh, <laughs> they, they are skeptical of my skepticism, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah, 
You know, I'm skeptical of their skepticalness. <laughs> no, a man, so there. <laughs> a man gets no respect in his own castle. <laughs> Hey, was, there, was there anything else we wanted to? Well, there's a front page story about how now we now we know um, why there's something rather than nothing. But ah, who cares? Oh, Dennis Overby. <laughs> yeah, that was that was good. It was again one of these things that amazingly becomes the most emailed story in the universe for a day or so. Yeah. Um, yeah it seemed to be displaced by you know something about dogs. <laughs> it's funny. I I wrote about. Uh, when I was covering particle physics a lot for Scientific American back in the uh, in the early 90s, I wrote about this matter antimatter symmetry. And, yeah. Um, and so, how- so this is just to, to to get some context. This is basically the thing where you know mathematically you would expect you know you have a theory of the Big Bang and you're going to produce matter and antimatter during during the uh, big explosion creation, and that there's no reason why there should be. I mean, I mean. It would predict that there's an equal amount of matter and antimatter because right. the universe is, of course, you know, basically the outgrowth of a mathematical equation. And, yet, and of course, we all know from watching, you know, Star Trek and things like that, Battlestar Galactica, that well, matter and antimatter comes together and annihilates itself. Mm-hmm. So why wasn't the universe still born? And then why did a little bit of matter survive the explosion because there was slightly more matter than antimatter? So we're here to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, it could have gone the other way around, I guess, and the antimatter would have had the upper hand, and there would be antimatter people sitting around talking about it. But then they, but then they would call the antimatter matter anyway, and the other stuff antimatter. So. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, so the problem isn't really solved, but just sort of advanced a bit, right? Yeah, and it's and again, you know, I I, I look at these stories coming. So this this particular piece of uh, research was done at. At Fermi Lab, which has just recently uh, been overtaken by the Large Hadron Collider in Europe as right. the uh, biggest accelerator in the world, and I'm sure those old lions at Fermi Lab don't want to be forgotten, and they want to show the world that they're still capable of doing some good. Physics. Oh well, sure, yeah, because there's no reason to get rid of Fermi Lab just because we got the LHC. Yeah, so we I want you as know, much of the stuff going on as possible. So you've got to read a little politics and. Um, and uh, social science into oh, a story like yeah. this, but it's you know it's cool. It's I, I well, what's it interesting to me is the way they explained this. You know, so the question is why was there slightly more matter than antimatter, and then it turns out to have something to do with um, a certain type of muon, mm-hmm. which is a particle, which is as Dennis described in the usual shorthand for muons, which is sort of like a fat electron, right? Which is a very good way just to you know to get a quick you know quick. Um, grasp on it, but that, this, that these particles oscillated constantly between their matter and their antimatter state, but uh, they spent slightly more time in the matter state than the antimatter state. Mm-hmm. So, but that only explains it in the extent, to the extent that you've basically taken it and then, you know, kind of pushed it to a different level, and now you have to explain why this muon has this particular behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's a, there, there was a great quote from uh, at the end of the story um, from um, Joe Lichen. Oh, Joe Joe Licken, who was Licken. Uh, one of my favorite sources when I wrote about this stuff for the Times, and and you know there's that cliche about you know oh we you know when we find this theory we will have found the face of God, and mm-hmm. he said something like, well I think you know maybe at best this is more like finding the toe of God, <laughs> right. <laughs> Or maybe the toenail. Yeah, the toenail. But anyway, it's yeah. yeah I it's, think, it's great that the stories like that get such currency. You know, yeah. People. I think yeah. discovering the toe of God deserves to be on the front page of the New York Times. Yeah, it does. It does. So, okay. We, we finished yeah, well, should we wrap up? it up? And yeah, we're over an hour. Yep, sounds good. Well, I'll see you in a you know a few weeks. We kind of jumped jumped earlier into the queue this time. But, yeah. Uh, um, well, I know you're doing. Uh, Science, your science writing workshop uh, next oh, week. Oh, yeah, that starts Monday. God, yeah. So good luck with that. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it'll be great. We have a good good group of people here. I'll talk a little about it next time we get together for for, for breakfast with John and George. Okay, sounds good. Okay, John, see you soon.